So the next talk is by Professor Vishwesha Guttal of the Indian Institute of Science. You should go ahead. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks to the organizer for invitation and uh, a very, very happy birthday to Sriram. Uh, people have said a lot of things about Sriram, so I wouldn't add much more. Uh, it's been, uh, actually, I was really lucky and privileged to have advised one student jointly with Sriram. You know, you know Sriram for active matter, right? You know, but we also worked on scales as large as this, you know, where we were looking at uh, forests and savanna ecosystems, thinking about them uh, from the perspective of phase transitions. So I won't talk about this work today. Uh, I will talk about some recent work that we are doing in our lab on uh, collective motion in finite flocks. So why finite flocks? Typically, the physics-based approaches to understand uh, collective motion has been sort of driven by theories that work in the macroscopic limit, thermodynamic limit. So, but many real flocks, if you think of uh, uh, many, many organisms, you know, they're often uh, consisting of really small numbers. And therefore, in such numbers, the stochasticity uh, that is intrinsic to individual behavior uh, doesn't average out completely and uh, it can produce some non-trivial effects. So that is what I'm going to talk about today, using both theory as well as uh, uh, you know, real data sets. So in our lab, we work on, with this broad focus, we work on characterizing motion of uh, uh, finite flocks. We also look at function and evolution of uh, finite flocks, like flocks from an ecological as well as evolutionary perspective. And the recurring theme in many of these studies uh, is the surprising role that uh, stochasticity plays in these systems. Okay, so let me begin by showing these uh, uh, few videos. So I don't know. It's not full screen here for some reason. Are you able to see this moving now? Okay, great. Uh, they should have played automatically, some technical glitches, I suppose. So what you are seeing here are basically, uh, you know, videos, okay, videos, if they're moving, videos of uh, uh, fish schools, actually of three different species. These two species are experiments we have done in our lab. This comes from our collaborator in France. And if you look at the collective motion, well, visually, you know, there are some differences, uh, but then there are also many commonalities. They all school, and they also uh, uh, have some differences that you can see their cohesion, polarization seems to exhibit some differences. So how do we characterize and understand these uh, collective motion, which are really in small numbers? These experiments are, uh, have usually just tens of individuals, not really large numbers. Okay, so that's the goal of uh, uh, today's talk. And in particular, I, we are interested in the sort of standard which I call a parameter, where we look at the orientation of each individual. We can get those from image tracking of fish. And then we plot uh, the, this order parameter as a function of time. So a very specific goal that we are interested is to actually write down a stochastic differential equation that captures the dynamics of this group polarization. And in this stochastic differential equation, we have this uh, drift term, deterministic part, sort of mean field, sort of uh, deterministic mean field equivalent. And then we have a diffusion term, the, stoch the strength of stochasticity in the, in the dynamics. And I want to emphasize one thing here. The strength of this stochasticity can be a multiplicative noise. It's not a typical additive noise. And I'm ignoring the spatial terms primarily because I'm looking at really small flocks, right? So which I think is a reasonable approximation given that the numbers we are looking at is really small. So what I want to do at the end of this talk is to look at what is this drift function and diffusion function for each of those fish videos I showed. Can we characterize those from real data? Can we have a theory that sort of guides us to getting what are these terms going to be? So let me first present a very basic uh, model a spin model where there is no motion, there are just simple copying interactions. Just two interactions. One is a stochastic pairwise interaction. A, an arbitrarily chosen fish finds another arbitrarily chosen fish 
and copies the direction of motion with some rate c. Uh, on the other hand, the, the, any given fish can also stochastically turn without interacting with anybody. So just two simple rules. I just want to emphasize this is not same as the classic Wichek rule. Wichek rule is basically you average some neighborhood, right? So here I just pick one random neighbor. So now, uh, now from this, that's a good question. In this case, no. So I'm looking at a mean field model here, but I will, I will, we will do. I will show you the results of those as well. Okay. Random neighbor, because I'm looking at really small flocks of 15 individuals, I assume everybody's a neighbor. Okay. So I'm focusing really on the small size limits here. Okay. And then I want to calculate this uh, group polarization given these two dynamics, and then without going into the mathematical calculations. So the summary of how we get this differential equation is that uh, we basically write down a master equation, a Fokker Planck equation using the Van Campus system size expansion. If you do that, then there are two interesting things to notice. The first is the deterministic term in this model. The drift term is a simple linear term that actually decays the order. So, uh, Okay, that's the first interesting thing, which is not entirely surprising, you know, because in the Wichek model, you're averaging a whole bunch of neighbor, right? Uh, or even in the topological models, you're averaging a whole bunch of neighbors. Here, I'm looking at a single random neighbor. So the deterministic term is telling you that the order will decay over time. However, if you look at the stochastic term, the diffusion term, there are two interesting things. The stochastic term is not a constant. It depends on the order parameter itself. Okay, and then there's also a group size dependence. So this is what this simple finite size, system size expansion theory predicts. And, uh, and, uh, and so that's what we have. And the interesting thing is in this system, if you take a thermodynamic limit, you don't expect any order. The order just decays to zero. I want to emphasize one thing here. So typically when we think of simple Langevin equations with additive noise, the, the, the sort of, you know, the state of the system is around the deterministic stable equilibrium, right? So in this case, m is equal to zero is a stable equilibrium, assuming alpha is uh, positive. So this is what the PDF you expect. However, when you have a multiplicative noise like this, look at the multiplicative noise term. Exactly when m is equal to zero, this term is maximum, okay? And if, and if, the, if this uh, strength of this noise is above some threshold value, what you actually get is, a, uh, you know, stable states, a modes of the PDF which are away from the deterministic stable state. And uh, these are called, uh, you know, noise-induced states where basically the multiplicative noise drives the system away from deterministic stable equilibrium. It can produce modes which are where you don't even expect, okay? And in fact, this is the form of the equation we have for this pairwise align, uh, you know, alignment interaction model. And what this then suggests is that if the n is sufficiently small, which means the stochastic is sufficiently high, although the deterministic system is predicting a disordered system, you can actually have ordered flock in this system. But that is true only for finite flocks, not for macroscopic flocks. Okay? That's the first prediction of this very, very simple model. Now, I will now go to a more complex model, which is to include a ternary interaction where three fish interact together. For example, you can think of this as uh, a triad interaction where the most misaligned fish will turn towards, sorry, will turn towards one of these two guys. Okay. So, and again, again we do an analytical theory for this uh, without going into details. Uh, we get a different differential equation here. Uh, let me contrast how this is different from the previous one uh, in, this, uh, in this slide. So look at the deterministic term. Deterministic term was linear with a negative slope, suggesting that the disordered state was stable in the pairwise interaction model. But in this ternary interaction model, we have a cubic term. And if h is greater than uh, a threshold value, which I think is greater than a in this case, what you have is actually, uh, 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 a drift function which is uh, which is cubic uh, with three roots where disorder m is equal to zero is now an, now an unstable state. And in fact, this is what the classic 
uh, Vichek model. Um, towards one of these two, but that's not a very strict tool. I could have assumed that it turns towards the average of the two. So those details do not seem to matter for the rest of the calculations. We have also done simulations to check that. Yeah, sorry, you have. Be a vector, so in the plots. Hi, M is a vector, you're right. So what and is M minus one? Uh, say that again. Uh, Can you show the graphs? Graphs of? Yeah, which, the which plots. Graph? No, the uh, plots, plots of will M. Come, come eventually. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, what is graph? negative M in that plot? Ha, ah, ha. So basically, I'm plotting mod M here. I'm oh, sorry, no, not mod M. You can think of it as projection of M over one of the two axes, MX or MY. So I, this is a bit of a cartoon representation. Sorry, I was not very clear. So you can think of this M of X, and I'm looking at this is F of X. So basically, I can split this equation to DMX by DT and uh, DMY by DT. I was just representing this along one of the projections. It's one component. Yes, along one component. The modulus of M, right? Uh, this is not, the modulus of M will be only above zero. Yeah, you're right, absolutely right, yes. But you know, this is basically circularly symmetric. There's nothing really happening along circle. Yeah, thanks for that uh, catch. Yeah. So, so basically, this is the summary of the two models here. Uh, you know, a pairwise model predicting disorder to be the thermodynamically stable state. Whereas the ternary model predicts that uh, when the, this ternary interactions are above a threshold value, you have disorder is uh, unstable, therefore you have these two stable states. And in both of these cases, we have a multiplicative noise. Both the systems are driven by multiplicative noise. In the pairwise alignment interaction model, this multiplicative noise alone can produce ordered states when n is sufficiently small. Okay, that's the sort of story of the analytical theory what we also, so in this theoretical framework, there was no motion. It's just spin models. What we also did was uh, implemented a sort of hybrid topological metric model where we assumed individuals are now moving in space. And when they move in space, there is a sort of radius around them. And within that radius, they pick one random neighbor. That becomes a stochastic pairwise spatial model. It could also pick two random neighbors in that sort of, you know, uh, in a zone, uh, but these need not be the two nearest neighbors. This could be any two neighbors in that zone. And then we also did a check like averaging, which is you pick everybody in that neighborhood and do, then do an averaging. So what is interesting is that the, even in the spatial model, we get qualitatively similar uh, differential equations. Uh, and secondly, even in the check averaging, we get uh, the, the expression of the SD is basically uh, qualitatively similar to what we found with the ternary model. So basically anything more than you know, one individual interaction will always give you this functional form, as long as there are local alignment-like rules. Okay. So this is where we stand with the predictions of theory of finite flocks. Uh, now I want to go and ask, what do fish, what are these fish doing? Uh, which of the two models are they showing? Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. That need not be fully connected because I can define the zone as radius now. Yeah. Uh, in the equations I showed, I sort of wrote the global order parameter and wrote an equation for global order parameter without worrying about the spatial coupling. I see, so then gradients and density will... We are ignoring all this, so I'm only looking at, you know, what happens to the global order parameter. Okay. And uh, you can, you're right that in some species, the density fluctuations might be important. We haven't done those analysis. So we're sort of working with the principle that because the numbers we're looking at is sufficiently small, I can sort of ignore the space, but you're right that it need not be perfectly valid. But with small numbers, I would imagine that density fluctuations are even more enhanced, <laughs> right? Because you no know, one yeah. one person. We have the measured group. the nearest neighbor distances for these. They are really tightly peaked around. You know, okay. Yeah. They don't show huge fluctuations. And yeah, that's true with the starlings and as well as midges, as far as I know. They're, the density fluctuations don't seem to be, you know, uh, really large. Okay. So let's go forward. What is what is the model for fish schools now? 
Remember that for the fish schools, I can do this image tracking. I can calculate the uh, vector order parameter mx, my. Although I'm showing only the modulus here, I do have both mx, my as a function of time. So the question is, what is the equation of motion? If I just gave you this time series data, can you tell me what is the underlying stochastic differential equation? So it turns out that that's the inverse problem, right? You know, okay, I'm just showing you now the mx, my time series for all the three, all the three. Um, uh, species, and uh, you notice that there are some gaps here. Those gaps are because we are not able to track really well uh, when they sort of, sort of you know, aggregate too much. But otherwise, we have fairly good uh, long time series. Okay, and if you look at again the sort of you know the polarization histograms, they sort of look qualitatively similar. Quantitatively, of course, they have some differences. They are all highly polarized schools in this case. Uh, and uh, so now we are interested in the inverse problem. If I had given you this data, how do I know what is the underlying, underlying dynamical equation? Remember that you know both the models I showed you could produce PDFs like this. Both the stochastic pairwise model and the ternary stochastic models, and even the classic Vecek averaging model, all of them can produce PDFs of the order parameter like this, high order states even at uh, small numbers when the interactions are strong enough. The question is, can I really distinguish between the three models? How do we do that? So that requires us to go from time series data to equations. Now, I will not go, go into this, uh, this work in much more detail. So the idea that if you have a stochastic time series, under some conditions, you can actually extract a stochastic differential equations is sort of known and hidden somewhere uh, for example, in Van Kampen's book, if you were to go and dig, you would know that there's something called a jump moment approximation one can do. And if you calculate two jump moments, you actually know these two terms. This is the first jump moment of the time series, this is the second jump moment of the time series. And then if you, what we have done is we have incorporated something called a sparse regression, which is an sort of a new technique in the engineering field to sort of identify equations uh, uh, using the sort of you know, minimal assumptions. So we have one of my students developed a Python package that takes this time series as an input and will produce uh, you know, these two functions as outputs. So we are welcome to try this out. Uh, okay, so now uh, let us see. Now if we now use this pipeline of calculating jump moments and identifying the equations, what do you find? So this is the first species called Karimin. These are uh, found in uh, southern part of India as well as Sri Lanka. Uh, so what do you find? So we find that the drift for this, this fish species is actually a linear uh, function with a negative slope at zero. Okay, if you remember, this is precisely what the stochastic pairwise model was predicting. And if you look at the diffusion, it's a parabolic function, an inverted parabolic function, where the stochasticity is largest when the system is disordered. So what I'm showing, these are the sort of you know, full functional forms, the vector functional forms, and this is the projection over one of the axes. Okay. And, uh, and if you now write down the equations, uh, you know, it, it actually is uh, exact the same equation that the stochastic pairwise model predicted, and which I told you in this model, uh, in the n is equal to infinity limit, there is no or order, right? So the order arises entirely because of finiteness of n, which is why we call this intrinsic uh, noise-induced schooling. So the, the, the schooling is arising entirely because n is small, therefore the strength of stochasticity is large, and this large stochasticity at, at disordered state actually drives the system away from this stable equilibrium, and therefore the observed state actually has a peak at m is equal to one and not m is equal to zero. And in fact, the, the idea of the, this multiplicative noise leading to some counterintuitive states has been there in the physics for a fairly long time. I think since 70s and maybe late 70s and early 80s, um, there was also a book uh, called Noise Induced Transitions by Horst Temke and Lefebvre. So we are finding one, I think this might be one of the very few examples of such a sort of, you know, counterintuitive state driven by noise uh, uh, in the biological context. Now, uh, let us see what happens to this, these guys. Uh, these are, these are uh, uh, fish from my 
our collaborator in France. Uh, somehow I, this, I just don't so you see those lights here. Uh, so I, I don't know how to make them move. Okay, so now if you calculate the drift and diffusion function for these guys, it turns out that these guys follow which check like drift. They are cubic with a slope uh, positive at zero, which means that there's an unstable equilibrium. And the, even without the you know, presence of noise of this structure, system would quickly move away from the disordered state and settle into an ordered state, okay? Uh, so we, we were also able to get an equation for this using the same technique. And then therefore, we would call this Vichek like, you know, in course deterministic schooling in the sense that the structure of noise is not crucial to obtain the schooling state because the disordered state is actually an unstable state here. Okay. And this is really, I mean, to me, this is really fascinating because if you go back and look at the two sort of fish school videos, I know they look a bit different, but honestly, I mean, you know, it's hard to tell that they would be so dramatically different, like, you know? This has a linear drift and this has a cubic drift. That's a really dramatic difference in terms of what's the underlying the dynamics. Okay, now next we have, I showed you one more, right? The third one. Uh, remember that you now this is nicely following into one of these two patterns. You know, either this or this, one of these two patterns. Okay, now we, I showed you one more, the third one called Tiger Bobs. These are found in, uh, I think, uh, Southeast Asian, uh, 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 countries, um, and we get them uh, plenty in our, why do we have them? Because uh, they're easily found in our aquariums. Even. Okay, so now if you look at the drift function of this, this is something very, very different. This actually has uh, the, you know, a fifth order function. If you look at the projection here, it has five roots. It's neither like the simple stochastic pairwise model, neither is it like uh, the, classic Vichek averaging model. And we do not fully understand uh, why this is the case. And we have some potential ideas which we are still thinking about. Uh, but this doesn't seem to follow either of the basic you know, alignment models. We are still figuring out uh, you know, how to understand this behavior. Uh, we have some potential ideas. For example, we think that maybe you know, when these fish move, they often have a tendency to sort of turn back almost sort of, you know, in addition to the sort of ferromagnetic-like interactions, they may have some anti-ferromagnetic-like interactions. And that could potentially explain these sort of sign, change, sign changes in the sort of, you know, mean field term. Okay, so we still don't understand that, you know. So sort of to summarize what we have found is that the sort of these three different uh, fish species which show collective behavior and schooling and which show very similar uh, PDFs of the order parameter, okay, all of them show high schooling, high order orientation, they actually come from a very, very different sort of, you know, structure of, uh, dynamical structure. So one of them has this linear drift with negative slope, other has more like, you know, classic check like uh, drift function. The third one has a much more complex drift function which we don't fully understand. And, uh, and, and uh, just sort of, sort of put this in perspective to, uh, in addition to a few other studies. One study previously on the locusts does seem like vichek like okay? The locust swarms seems to have a feature which is vichek like And then recently we are working with Shashi in NCBS where we find that the beetles also have vichek like features, you know, uh, vichek like vichek model-like features. So, uh, uh, so, at least among this sort of uh, systems we have studied, three of them seem to follow sort of classic check like alignment interactions, uh, whereas the two others are very different, okay? So with that, uh, I think I'm also done with my time. Uh, so the, to summarize, so sort of I hope I convinced you why uh, the study of uh, fine blocks in the, in the finite size limit is actually a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of thing to look at. And uh, in the sort of, you know, models and theory of this finite flocks with local alignment, we found that we can have two classes of schooling. One is a noise-induced schooling, which arises with in small schools with stochastic pairwise interactions. Other one is which like deterministic schooling, uh, which is present in systems with ternary or higher order interactions. 
And then what we showed was that using the idea of data derived equations uh, of, from time series, we were able to show that one of them actually belonged to the noise induced cooling class. One fish species and two other species seem to belong to the Wichekle deterministic class of schooling. And the third one is something crazy we don't fully understand right now. So your comments are welcome. Uh, okay, so with that, I think I'm perfect. So thank you very much. And I would like to thank uh, all the funding agency students and the, you know, all these other fishy people uh, and fishy collaborators. Thanks to all of them, uh, you know, experiments, uh, tracking, and, you know, time series analysis, and then a physics-like theory. All of it requires a large number of people with very, very different set of skills. So th I'm lucky to have all those uh, students. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Vishu. Uh, hi, very nice talk. So your uh, talk reminded me of uh, something I'd heard about. A diff so do all your fish, can all your fish see? And is your uh, dish super saturated with food for the fish? So there is no food in this tank. Okay. So they're, in fact. Uh, but they're well fed. They're not worrying about, they're not competing for food or, or anything. It's usually the standard protocol in all the fish experiments is that we start them for a day before we take. Okay. So exactly the opposite because uh, one of the reasons is that, so uh, collective foraging is sort of, a strategy that animals have evolved. Right. So maybe they will show better foraging when they are actually starved. So that okay. brings me to my other question. Are your fish, do they have eyesight? Can they see? Yes. The, re the reason I ask this is because you're probably aware that in uh, cave fish, Mexican cave fish, mm -hmm. which are blind, yeah. the yeah. local interactions between fish are very different and they will not align and you don't see schooling and they turn away when they meet other fish. So I'm, I was thinking that in your fish, that actually don't align as well and don't, you know, sort of school as well, the last group, right? Yeah. I don't know, evolutionarily, maybe there are some things that are changing which make them different from the other fish and the local interactions are different, you know. Any, anyway, so that, that was just thought. That's a great question. Fish do see uh, and they have a very good vision, all these three species. What if you turn off the light or something? They, this is a great question, actually. You know, they don't school as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I mean, such an elaborated observation, you know, if you reduce the light intensity, they don't school as well. At the back. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I might be wrong, but uh, the first thing impression about the movies uh, is that I see less order when they are in the middle of the container, and when they go near the boundary, they are more ordered. So do you put in boundary effects in your model? That's a, that's a great question. So. This is a very difficult question to also address, you know, because any experiments you do will have boundaries. So it's impossible to get rid of boundaries fully in the experimental system. It is also well known that many species, including fish, have some affinity towards boundary. It sort of acts like a shelter for them. So sort of, you know, when instead of being in an entirely open area, whenever they can find something like a physical shelter, they actually go near them. And that seems to be happening in all the three of them, but with very different degrees. For example, the first one, the leftmost one, the Karimim, they show a lot more tendency to move towards the center than the one in the middle. The middle ones, although the specific clip I showed you had a lot more moving to the center, if you look at the statistics of the entire experimental duration, they spend massive amounts of time near the boundary. So there is a boundary effect. We have done uh, experiments with different arena sizes. We have also done analysis where we look at data. Let's say only half the area at the center of the, you know, um, you know, the, the, of the circular arena, and the other data, half the data from the uh, data need not be half half. The area, the data present when they're in the area, inner half and outer half. The results all usually do not change. I will not say they will not always change. By and large, they don't seem to change. That sort of, you know, structure of the equations they do not change. But, you know, these sort of, you know, these things sort of, you know, the, the overall landscape shifts a bit. Yeah. From there, Mukund, please. Yeah, great, great talk, Vishu. I'm, I'm wondering how to get some independent verification for your microscopic uh, proposed mechanism. Mm. During your inference process that you described, in the time series, can you figure out which part of the time series most contribute to the inference process? Is it precisely when one fish sort of greatly misaligns and comes back? Mm -hmm. 
and can you then see the specific um, kind of triplet interaction or whatever that you that you proposed? Yeah. Uh, very, I think it's a great question, but also incredibly hard. I think the you know exact testing of the local interactions would be very hard for several reasons. Uh, let's say I do experiments like this: a single fish experiment where I characterize their self-propulsion motion, okay, on their own. Let's say I now do a two-fish experiment where I characterize pairwise interactions. Let's say I now do it sequentially. Even if I deduce something, there is no guarantee that they would follow those rules when they are in a group of 15. So even if I were to use that protocol and arrive at some interaction functions between fish, that always remains the challenge. So, but you know, but that's whatever I just said, you know, doing this, you know, in fact, we have done those one, two, one, up to 10 and try to sort of construct interaction functions. And in fact, uh, we have done that completely for one of the cases, which is the middle one. And uh, the predictions of the microscopic model perfectly matches. Okay, Shikant has a bike. Just a quick uh, follow up. <clears throat> so, um, you know, in terms of validation, I guess you could change something in the setup of the experiment, such as the geometry, mm -hmm. and, and see if, if, if uh, your equations predict the, the motion that you see. Is that, would that be a valid, uh, so a reasonable validation? validation? For the equations and validation for the microscopic rules. If it is the latter, the validation of microscopic rules, I think that's an, in my opinion, I mean, you know, you also have a lot of experience in this. I think it's almost a very difficult problem. Almost there are a lot of degenerate solutions. Many, many different type of interactions will produce similar coarse grained equations. I think entirely determining what are those is actually, in fact, I think it's, a, in, in my opinion, actually an ill post question. We cannot really ask what each fish are doing without really uh, trying to say, I want to explain this quantity Q. So what fish are doing exactly at the microscopic level, I think that question has a meaning only if I know what I want to explain. And depending on what I want to explain, I think this, this will actually change. For example, I did not speak about cohesion at all. I was only talking about alignment because my interest was group polarization. But they're also, also highly cohesive. So, you know, I had, have entirely ignored that, right? So, yeah. That's for the validation of the equations. I, I want to think a bit more and come back to it. Yeah. We'll take one question from here and then yeah. maybe move out. Okay, hi. Um, thank you for the talk. And I have two question comments, uh, one nasty and one very nasty. So <laughs> the first one is the following. So you're basically trying to fit the force. And so let's say that you're fitting the potential. Let's say the yeah. integral of that. Yeah. So in some cases you find uh, a quadratic term and then a quadratic plus a quartic term, and then a quadratic plus a quartic plus a sixth term. So this looks very much to me like a polynomial expansion of something that will be go there. And, uh, and we know that that is always the case. The problem is that what is relevant and what is not relevant when you take some limit. So this brings me to the second comment. Do you think there is a difference between finite size and small? So in other terms, um, do you think there is a size beyond which there is an emergence of collective properties, mm -hmm. even though it's still finite size, or whatever is below 10 to the 23 for you is finite size, including 10? I mean, you know, you know, so thinking from a sort of a theoretical point of view, that requires me to derive the stochastic differential equations, right? So I do need a minimum number n to even sort of do a system size expansion. So I think that's the minimum size I have to maintain for the equations to be valid. If I take just two fish, I think these equations, I don't think will make sense because I'm describing a polarization. Which so is two is small, small. 10 yeah. is medium. See I, see, I mean, I think- So there is know, some number between two and 10. <laughs> yeah, I wish I knew this magic number, <laughs> okay. Uh, but you know, uh, I can tell you based on the, uh, the, the sort of you know, analysis we have done, Usually 10 and above, uh, the sort of, you know, the, the functions, the drift and diffusion function that I just visually see, they are smooth. But if I go less than 10, like five, sometimes I see some weird sharp features. And I think that's when, you know, the, so basic assumption, if I, know, if I think about it mathematically, the basic assumption for the system says expansion is that the M order parameter M is sort of continuous, which is, basically a combination of discrete number of individuals velocity vectors, right? So when can I make the continuum approximation 
is the that that determines me the minimum number I need, and that seems to de depend on the fish species. Now, why so? Some species have this behavior that they just turn back like this. So, if there are five fish going like this, order parameter is now one. One of them turns back in, now jumps back to point eight, like inst almost instantaneously, right? That makes the construction of these functions very hard and sort of you know meaningless. But uh, there is another fish species, Atroplacarim, in the first one I showed you, the left one. They move very smoothly. They don't do this sort of you know turns, which are sort of you know into the flock or into the school. There, even five showed very beautiful smooth functions. So, but do you now, realize with, the less no, with 10 <laughs> fish, even in two dimension, you <laughs> just have one at the interior of the group, so you don't have any bulk with yeah. 10 fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's just surface dynamics yes, in that yes, case. Yes, yes. Okay. In the interest of time, maybe we should just break now and save questions for the rest. Let me thank both speakers in this session. Thank you.